Hi, welcome back. Um, this is the fourth lecture of the lecture series. Um, before we get going, um, I had requested in, in one of the previous lectures that if you have any questions, you should you should email me. And I, I did get a, a question. I'm not sure who it's, who it's from. I didn't recognize the email address. It's one of those sort of garbled hotmail uh, addresses, and they didn't sign their name. They said, um, nice lecture. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, they said, I have a question. And the question is, what happened to the beard? So that was the kind of question I was actually um, uh, expecting, but uh, actually the, the beard is a casualty of coronavirus. Uh, I've had a beard for 20 years, but um, it seems that uh, more and more people feel that it's, when you go out, it's important to wear a, um, a mask. And there is some evidence that wearing a mask with a beard is less effective than without a beard. So uh, after 20 years, I've gotten rid of the beard. And um, and uh, the wife is okay with it, so so it's probably going to stay this way for a while. Anyway, um, uh, the subject of, of today's lecture is is London theory, uh, and this this theory is um, basically treating uh, superconductors as just being superfluids of uh, charged bosons. Um, it was developed by uh, the London brothers Heinz and and Fritz London um, when they were actually in Oxford in around nineteen. 1935. They were brought to Oxford by uh, by Frederick Lindemann, who was the head of the um, Oxford Physics Department. He actually became quite important in the in the in in the UK during during the war. He was uh, a scientific advisor to to Churchill. He was uh, elevated to the peerage. Later became Viscount Lind uh, Viscount Churwell um, was his um, uh, his name as as, as royalty. Um, but anyway, he was he he had this program for bringing. Uh, Jewish refugees uh, to Oxford and then uh, later to other jobs. And London theory, which is probably the most important contribution of uh, Heinz and Fritz London, uh, was developed while they were here at Oxford. It's sort of interesting that the uh, treating the superconductor as a superfluid of charged bosons, this was actually done historically before superfluidity in helium was, uh, was even discovered. And many of the ideas uh, of superfluidity would, were actually discussed first in the context of superconductors before they were uh, discussed in the sort of simpler context of, of helium. So we're basically, you know, the, the essence of London theory is a superconductor. Oops, that's not going to work. Try this. A superconductor uh, is just a superfluid. Fluid of charged bosons, charged bosons. Um, and just like we did with, with helium, we're going to postulate this is a super part of the, of, of the fluid. Some of the bosons are, are in the superfluid condensate and some of the, the bosons are, are normal. They're not in the superfluid condensate. And we're mainly going to be concerned with the dynamics of the superfluid part because the normal part is, is boring. Uh, the, the, those uh, bosons, those charged bosons, they do move around a little bit, um, but not like the, um, not like the, the superfluid part. The superfluid part moves uh, with persistent current. And, you know, the currents will last forever and, and they, it moves very, very readily uh, with no scattering. Um, and so we're going to focus almost entirely on the um, on the superfluid part of the of the of the bosons and not the, not the normal part. Um, so the the basic um, approach is to write down a dynamical equation for the motion of the superfluid part, um, which is basically just just Newton's law, uh, the acceleration d velocity uh, dt. Um, partial t, um, d velocity uh, dt is the force divided by the mass, and the force will be um, minus the, the charge on the boson times the electric field, and then divided by the mass. Now I'm going to put stars on both the uh, charge and, and the mass, um, and that's to indicate that we actually don't know what the charge of the boson is. We don't know whether it's uh, the boson has charge one uh, and mass one electron, or if it has charge two, which actually it does. In the end, we'll discover um, uh, mass two uh, electrons and charge of two electrons, or mass four electrons and charge of, of uh, four electrons. We don't know how big the cluster is that forms 
forms a boson. The only thing that this that London theory is going to know is um, is the ratio um, e over m, e star over m star, is going to be known in this theory and not the individual e and m itself. Okay, so this could be um, could be e over m or two e over two m or four e over four m. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is um, basically just uh, um, just Newton's equation. You can also think of it as as just being um, drew to theory with no scattering term at all. Um, so we can then write the current of this, the superfluid current, the charge current. So this is charge. Uh, current, superfluid charge current, super charge current, um, which is just going to be the uh, charge per particle, the density of these particles times the superfluid velocity. And again here, we don't know what the charge of a cluster is. The E star times N star, N star is, is density here, N, N S uh, star is density, number density uh, of bosons, and again we don't know what the what the charge of a, a cluster is. Um, we know only the product of e star times n star. So it could be a um, uh, hundred uh, bosons per um, cubic centimeter where each boson is charged one, or it could be 50 bosons per centimeter where each boson is charged two, the product uh, E star times N, N star is going to be the same either way. So this uh, product is the total charge, oops, total charge density, charge density. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a, a theme of London theory. We don't know how big the, the boson charge cluster is. Okay, so just uh, putting together these two, this equation with, uh, with this equation, we then derive um, the change in uh, supercurrent with uh, time is then uh, E star squared, NS star over M star times uh, the electric field. And this pre, in this prefactor, um, this prefactor here again, the the size of the of the of the boson, the the number of uh, of electrons that, that form a boson, uh, doesn't matter. It'll cancel out. Um, this equation is known as the um, first London equation. Circle it. Um, first London equation. And it is exactly just drew to theory with no scattering whatsoever. That the charge accelerates due to the due to the electric field and it accelerates uh, completely freely. Okay, from here we'll take the curl of the first London equation. Uh, del cross js, oops, del cross djs dt, del cross djs dt, and that will be the same prefactor, e star squared ns star over m star, prefactor that doesn't know about the size of the, uh, how many charges there are in a boson, and then we have curl of E, and then we can use, we know where curl of E shows up, it shows up in Faraday's law, so Maxwell's equation, so we can use uh, Faraday to rewrite that as um, E star squared NS star, M star and then um, times minus dB dt. That. Um, good. All right. Now we have uh, time derivatives on both sides. So let's just integrate with respect to time, and we'll get um, curl of Js equals um, this factor minus E star squared NS star over m star um, times b plus an integration constant, which I'll call c uh, of r. Okay, This is an important equation, so we'll, we'll circle this one too. Um, now, 
And the point here is that the j, j and, and b can be uh, time dependent, but c of r is uh, time independent a constant. Now, we, we don't know what the value of this constant c is, but we know it's a, a constant time. And we can imagine an example, uh, a way of setting up our experiment such that we can, we can pin down what, that, uh, what the value of c is, at least for one set of initial conditions. So let's imagine an initial condition where there's zero current flowing in the, in the superconductor and the, car and the superconductor is sitting in zero magnetic field. And that tells us that this constant c is zero at the initial time and therefore it's uh, zero for all time thereafter. For at least for this set of initial conditions, we can fix uh, the value of the, of the constant c. Okay, we're now going to use, uh, we're going to imagine that we've set up the, the, um, our system in some set of initial conditions. We may turn on some magnetic fields and we wait for the thing to come to steady state. So there will be some persistent currents flowing, there will be some magnetic fields in the, um, in the superconductor. We want to find out what the, what the persistent currents are and what the magnetic field is. So to do this, we're going to use Ampere's law, uh, Ampere, um, which is uh, del cross B is mu naught j. And I'm only writing, um, on the right-hand side here, I'm only writing the supercurrent because we assume that if, uh, after a long amount of time, the steady state of the normal current will be zero. The, the, the normal current is, is flowing resistively, so it will slow down and eventually come to, to, to a rest, and only the persistent supercurrent will uh, continue to flow, so we can ignore the normal part of the current. There's also, on the right-hand side, usually when you write Ampere's law, there's a dE dt term, um, which we're setting to zero also, um, because we're assuming that we're in a steady state situation, so uh, the electric field is not, is not changing either. So we, we take our Ampere's law, we can take the curl of Ampere's law, so we have del cross, del cross B, so that's mu naught del cross the uh, supercurrent, and then you'll notice that del cross the supercurrent is exactly what we have uh, up here in, in this nice equation, and we've set uh, the constant c equal to zero, so we get, um, I guess, minus mu naught e star squared uh, ns star over m star times the magnetic field, and then over on the left-hand side here, we use one of these uh, vector identities that we uh, learn and then promptly forget, but when you need it, you know where to look it up. Uh, the del cross del cross is del times del dot minus del squared uh, b, like this. And we know from another one of Maxwell's equations here that del dot b equals zero. That's the usual no monopoles condition. So the left-hand side is just minus the Laplacian of uh, the magnetic field b. These are all vectors. And so that means we can rewrite this set of equations as uh, del squared uh, b, the Laplacian of the, uh, the vector field b, is, is just mu naught e star squared ns star over m star times the vector field b. Now, this type of equation, it, it may have um, many solutions, um, but sort of a, a typical type of solution there may be various solutions uh, of this sort of equation, but a, a standard uh, solution might look something like this. The magnetic field as a function of some coordinate x is some constant magnetic field times e to the minus or, or plus or minus um, x divided by lambda, where lambda is, the, is a, a length scale, which is just the inverse square root of, of this combination here. So I'll write that out. Um, lambda equals uh, m star over um, mu naught e star squared n s star, with this big square root. And this is known as the penetration depth, or otherwise known as the London length. And in, in typical superconductors, this is tens to hundreds of nanometers, typically. I mean, it can be 
um, uh, be outside of that, but this is sort of typical for most superconductors. But notice it's inversely proportional to the, um, uh, the superfluid density, and as you go get close to the superconducting uh, the supercondu the superconducting transition from uh, temperatures below the superconducting transition, the uh, superconducting density, the superfluid density, drops to zero continuously, which means that it actually diverges gets much longer and diverges as T goes to TC from, from below, okay? Um, now, what is, what is this uh, equation actually, this equation actually telling us? What it's, it's telling us is, let's uh, draw, draw a plot. So we have a picture like this. So this will be X position on this axis, and this will be magnetic field on, on this axis. And then we'll, um, have a superconductor over on this side of the system, and then we'll be uh, just normal uh, 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 over, on, over on, on the left here. This is just air outside of the superconductor. So superconductor is this blue region over here, and uh, air out here, or some coolant. Um, and so the magnetic field is uniform outside the superconductor. And then when you get inside the superconductor, it drops off exponentially. Let's see if I can draw that looking like an exponential. Let's see if I can draw that looking like a better exponential. Kind of like that. And uh, as you go into the superconductor, the magnetic field drops off exponentially, and the, and the length scale of that drop off is uh, this uh, penetration depth lambda. Okay, that's really terrible. Uh, terrible lambda. Okay, that's lambda. Like that, that distance there is lambda. Um, so what this is telling us is, you know, from from this uh, this equation here, therefore giving us this this exponential decay, um, is that uh, magnetic field is screened going into uh, the superconductor. It's sc it's screened by the persistent um, currents. This persistent charge current keeps the um, magnetic field outside of the superconductor. Now this is fairly similar, or similar in spirit, I'll say approximately equal to Lenz's law. Um, and if you remember Lenz's law from your first year uh, E&M course, um, Lenz's law was the statement that when you, um, that uh, currents flow in a conductor so as to oppose changes in magnetic field. So if you start with a superconductor in zero magnetic field, and you turn on a magnetic field, currents will flow to oppose the change in magnetic field. And since the, the um, currents flow without, without any resistance, the, um, the magnetic field can be screened uh, perfectly. And since the currents never decay, the magnetic field never penetrates into the superconductor. So maybe it's not so surprising that if you have a piece of superconductor and if you, and if you turn on a magnetic field, um, since there's infinite conductivity, that the uh, magnetic field will never penetrate into the superconductor. But in fact, uh, the screening of magnetic fields outside in, uh, from superconductors is more than just Lenz's law. So screening, I'm going to write this down because it's important. Screening in superconductors is more uh, than Lenz's law. Um, now, why is that? Um, uh, well, this is experimental observation. Um, it was observed first in 1933 by Meisner and Oxenfeld. Um, Oxenfeld. Uh, it's usually referred to as the Meisner effect. Um, so Meisner was the big professor working in the laboratory. Oxenfeld was the young student. Oxenfeld actually discovered the effect. It didn't, wasn't completely clear what he was seeing. Meisner understood immediately what it was he was seeing and then went off and basically stole the experiment from, from Oxenfeld. I won't say, I mean, he wasn't, he just got very excited about it and started doing a lot of the experiments himself. Um, so what, what they saw was the following. Uh, you take a material that superconducts like, like aluminum something like that. Here's a big ball of aluminum. Um, and let's take T greater than TC and apply a magnetic field. So a magnetic field, make the magnetic field red. Um, so the magnetic field 
uh, above TC, the magnetic field penetrates perfectly, you know, with no trouble, it penetrates through the, through the superconductor. But then over here, same, same picture, there's our piece of aluminum, our, our superconducting material. If we cool it down to T below TC, what we find is the magnetic field becomes perfectly screened, expelled completely from the superconductor. The magnetic field lines go uh, entirely outside of the superconductor and inside the superconductor um, magnetic field is is exactly zero inside the superconductor. Um, so this is interesting because Lenz's law would not give you this. Lenz's law tells you that um, uh, the conductor, um, the, the, the current opposed changes in magnetic fields. And here we're not, you know, the magnetic field has changed. We're um, this, in this picture, the, the magnetic field is expelled from the superconductor. And the superconductor is, is expelling it, not because it's, cha it's, it's preventing changes in the magnetic field, it's expelling the, super con the, the magnetic field because it's actually the, the, the ground state solution of the system is the lower energy solution is to have um, the magnetic field outside of, of the superconductor. So it's lower energy to have the magnetic field outside of the superconductor, and it's not just an issue of preventing changes in magnetic fields. So in that sense, um, the screening of magnetic fields from superconductors is a thermodynamic statement that the energy is just lower when the magnetic field is outside the superconductor rather than a dynamic statement that you're trying to prevent changes in the, um, in the magnetic field. So cooling this way, going from T above TC to T below TC, the magnetic field is pushed out. So another way of saying this is this superconductors uh, are diamagnets. In fact, they're perfect diamagnets. It's a perfect diamagnet. Um, diamagnet. Uh, remember that a diamagnet is a material for which the magnetization opposes the applied magnetic field. And here, the magnetization um, opposes the magnetic field and is exactly opposite and equal to the magnetic field. So the net field um, uh, in sum of the mag applied magnetic field H and the and the uh, induced magnetization uh, M in, inside uh, conspire to give you exactly magnetic field zero inside um, the superconductor. So this is perfect diamagnetism, which actually gives the effect of uh, uh, levitation of superconductors, if you've ever seen that, if you've ever seen a superconductor uh, floating above a, a magnet, it's uh, actually any diamagnet uh, will do that. The diamagnets are attracted to minima of the magnetic field. So if you put a superconductor above a magnet, so I don't know, if you, if you take a magnet like this with magnetic field lines coming out of it like this, um, and you stick a piece of superconductor above it, the superconductor on the one hand, it's pulled down by gravity. On the other hand, it's, it's pushed, um, pushed up because it's attracted to the um, minimum of the, of the magnetic field, and it'll just end up hovering there. It's a rather um, interesting uh, effect. It's not special to uh, superconductors are very good at it because they're perfect diamagnets, but even um, weak diamagnets can be um, can be levitated uh, if you have a strong enough uh, magnetic field gradient. Okay, um, so how is it the Londons managed to explain the Meissner-Oxenfeld effect? Well, we have to scroll back, and I realize scrolling is a bit of a pain, all the way back to this equation here. And in this equation here, um, London said, well, I can explain the um, Meissner effect if I hypothesize that C of R is equal to zero independent of the initial conditions of, of the system. Now, we took this example that we said, well, if you start with a system that has zero currents and zero magnetic field, well, then C has to be zero, um, and then it has to be zero for all time thereafter, this uh, protocol that we did with the um, Meissner effect, uh, well, it's not starting with zero currents, it's not starting with, or it's not starting with zero magnetic field, so you wouldn't be able to derive C of R equals zero, or you wouldn't be able to argue it, but um, London just said, well, let's just take it as a postulate that this constant C of R is, um, 
is is always zero, independent of your initial conditions um, that you're setting up in um, in your experiment. So if you do that, so let's write down that that equation again. So that equation, um, oops, I'll do this in normal color. So del cross superconducting uh, current is then minus E star squared NS star over M star times the magnetic field. And this is um, uh, now with no constant added, which we just takes as a quality. And this is now known as the second London equation. Equation. Um, and both, and if you remember what the first London equation, let me just scroll back really quickly. I, I realize scrolling is a pain. Remember that the, this was the first London equation. Where is it? Way back up here. Uh, first London equation here um, tells you about the derivative with time of the, uh, of the superconductor and of uh, the supercurrent. And here, the second London equation tells me about the curl of the, uh, of the supercurrent. Now, um, we can actually summarize both the first and the second London equations um, uh, together. We'll just call it both London equations. Both London equations, done equations, can be written in the following form um, that the supercurrent is minus E star squared NS star over M star times uh, the vector potential. Um, and uh, to see that this is equivalent to both uh, London equations, first you can take, take the curl of this both London equations. If you take the curl of this, then uh, you get, well, del cross supercurrent on the left and curl of um, vector potential is just the magnetic field. If you take the time derivative on the left, the time derivative of the vector potential gives you the electric field, and so you get the first London equation. Now there's a um, catch to that, uh, two catches. One, we must choose the right gauge, use London gauge for this to make sense, gauge for the, for the uh, vector potential, and London gauge is that um, the divergence of the vector potential must be zero, and that makes sense because um, up here, the, um, uh, the, we know the divergence of the superconductor better be zero because just by current conservation, so we better have divergence of the, uh, of the vector potential be zero. And we also want that the zeroth component or the, uh, the scalar potential to be zero um, because uh, when we differentiate this uh, both London equation with respect to time to get the first London equation, we want the right-hand side to give us the electric field. And usually um, there will be a term associated with the, with the gradient of, of A naught, and we don't want to have that term uh, in our first London equation, so we just work in a gauge where A naught is, is zero. Okay. All right, so that's um, London's approach. Um, and we can rederive uh, the London equations in a slightly more quantum mechanical way, very similar to what we did um, with superfluid helium, with using the idea of an order parameter that we treat as a wave function, very, very similar to what we did uh, with helium. Now, um, this is not something that the Londons were aware of when they did their work in the 19, 1930s, although it was... Uh, worked out later by um, people in the Landau School and so forth. Um, so um, this is beyond what what the Londons knew. Um, you know, we have advantages over the Londons. I'll make the same joke that I've made many times. You know, we have advantages over the Londons that we know. Uh, you know, a hundred years, well, close to a hundred years more uh, quantum mechanics than they knew. We're also alive, and they're they're dead. So um, anyway. Uh, jokes are not as funny when I tell them just to myself. Um, all right, so we'll write the supercurrent, expression for the supercurrent. It will look very similar to what we did um, for... I do find it entertaining to tell myself jokes, though. The, uh, um, and, okay, so the supercurrent will be just be e, o, e star over m star. I'll talk about those factors in a moment. And this is the kind of thing that we saw for um, superfluid helium very similar to what we had for superfluid helium with minor differences and then 
minus right, like this p uh, plus e star a psi star times psi like this. Okay. Um, so what is different about this equation from what we had um, for superfluid helium? Well, first of all, I have E star over M star out front that we didn't have for superfluid helium. Um, and the reason for that is because what I am interested here is in charge current rather than number current. Um, uh, so I'm replacing, or rather the mass current, I guess, is what we had before. Um, but now I, I want a charge current, so I write E star over M star uh, out front to switch that. Secondly, um, I've minimally coupled the momentum operator to uh, the vector potential because these are charged objects. And this is what you do in, in quantum mechanics. Um, you know, you use, in quantum mechanics, you use a momentum operator, which is minus I h bar gradient. Um, but then you also have to minimally couple to the, um, to the uh, vector potential. Okay, this is, we should know that from our, um, uh, you know, quantum mechanics courses. Okay, so um, we're then going to follow exactly the same kind of prescription we used it for our uh, superfluid helium, which is we're going to write our wave function as some square root of the number density, some amplitude times uh, a phase. Um, and here, uh, just to be careful, that our superfluid density uh, times our superfluid uh, boson charge is going to be the total charge density. Um, this is now charge density. And uh, I have to be a little bit careful here because previously we used the symbol rho to mean mass density. Now we're switching it to charge density. I hope that doesn't confuse matters. Um, but with this expression uh, for the for the order parameter, or the, uh, effectively the wave function for our our superfluid, we can just plug this into the expression for the current, and without belaboring it, it's a very short number of steps. Um, we get the uh, superfluid current is given by uh, E star over M star N S star H bar gradient of theta, and this term this is exactly like what we had, this piece here is exactly like what we had before. The only difference is that we have an E star over M star out front because we're now interested in, um, we're interested in uh, the charge current rather than the, uh, the mass current. And then um, we will uh, have an additional term coming from the minimal coupling, which is now E star squared, oops, don't want a yet, ns star over m star times the vector potential a, which was not there in the um, for superfluid helium. Okay, uh, so this is now our expression for uh, the superfluid uh, charge current um, in, uh, uh, in in a superconductor, and we're going to uh, I'm going to postulate something. I'm going to postulate postulate, and we'll, we'll justify this later, um, that, in, or it's expectation really, that theta in ground state is constant. And, and this makes, makes some sense, you know, in quantum mechanics, if you twist a phase, that usually costs you some, some energy. Um, it's actually a gauge dependent statement, but in, in the simple London gauge, this will be true. And if that's the case, then the supercurrent is nothing more than E star squared N star with the minus sign out front, M star times the vector potential. And this is exactly what we call the both London equations. This was both London equations um, in, the, in the London gauge. Um, so that's uh, very satisfying that just from um, you know, writing down our wave function, uh, our charge current in terms of an order parameter or something that looks like a wave function, we immediately derive uh, the both London equations correctly. Okay. Now, um, once we, we had this um, 
for superfluid helium, um, the the next thing we, we did is we started looking at circulation. We looked at um, uh, um, integrating around a, a contour. So let's imagine here we have a, a superconductor. Uh, let me make the superconductor a different color. So the superconductor in, in some you know a torus or something like that, and we're going to imagine a path inside the torus going around the around the hole. Um, so if I integrate, um, let's do the integrate um, da -da -da, uh, around that path, path C, um, uh, JS dot DL. This is very analogous to what we did when we tried to calculate the circulation in the superfluid. It will now, um, looking back, here it is. So there's two terms. There's the gradient of theta term and there's a vector potential term. So this will now be uh, E star, NS star, there's an H bar over M star, then we have the integral of the gradient of theta DL around the path. Okay, so that's from the integrating the, the first term around, around, around the path. And then the second term will be the integral of the vector potential around the path E star, um, E star squared, N star, over m star, and then integral of a dot dl around the path. Um, so we'll take these these two terms one at a time. The um, lower term here, this the first term here, is this is exactly the same thing we had with superfluid helium. Um, when you integrate a gradient uh, around a loop, you have to come back to the same same quantity modulo 2 pi, because theta is only uh, defined 2 pi, so this has to give me 2 pi times uh, p, where p is an integer, some integer p. Um, this integer, oops, p, p is an integer. And uh, over here, the integral of the vector potential around a loop um, is, well, we can use Stokes' theorem. The integral of vector potential around the loop is the same as the integral over the disk that the loop bounds. So the boundary of the disk is, is the loop, uh, integral over that area of the curl of the vector potential. And that is then just the flux enclosed because the curl of the vector potential is the, um, is the magnetic field, right? So, okay, so putting these, these two things together and just uh, moving some constants around, we get the following uh, statement, that the integral of, uh, I'm not gonna move the constants around yet, js dot dl is then uh, e star ns star over m star h, Planck's constant without the two pi, I've absorbed the two pi um, into the h bar, times p with p an integer, minus e star squared n s star over m star times the flux enclosed. Now I'm going to move some constants around. Um, uh, here, some constants around um, and move some things to the other side. So I get the flux enclosed uh, plus m star over e star uh, squared ns uh, star superconducting density times the integral of the current uh, around the loop is equal to h over e uh, to a star times an integer p. So this equation is uh, the equation of quantization of the quantity on the left-hand side. So the quantity on the left-hand side always must be an integer times this um, factor h over e star. Um, the uh, quantity on the left is known, this combination is known as the fluxoid. It's the combination of both the flux enclosed and the current flowing around the loop. So let's um, go back to our experiment in the, in the torus like this. If we take our loop to be deep inside the body of the torus like this, then because of, of the Meissner effect, so if path is deep inside, 
inside superconductor, then uh, J the current is going to be zero. Okay, currents will always go to the uh, edge of the system, and uh, you know, screening to screen magnetic fields and so forth. If you go deep inside, the current will be um, will be zero, and um, that means that if the path is deep inside, then what's quantized is the flux is quantized. That implies the flux enclosed uh, is then h over e star times times an integer p. However, if the path is near the boundary of the system, then some of the then there can be currents flowing near the boundary of the system, and you will not measure the flux enclosed won't be exactly the right number, but it's the difference is made up by the integral of the uh, persistent currents that are flowing around. So this is, an, this is analogous to the quantization of circulation we found in super, superfluid helium, except here we need to keep track of not only the, the current flowing, but also the magnetic flux, and it's the sum of these two things, which is, strictly speaking, uh, quantized. Now, notice here, this is a rather in, important statement, that the, the quantum h over e star, which uh, it's in, in which these things are quantized, it knows about the fact that e star equals 2e. Okay? All the way through London theory, we didn't know how big the, the charge carrier was, whether it was a boson of charge 1, charge 2, charge 4, didn't matter. It was only E over M, the charge over the mass, uh, mattered. Um, so here, um, the if you can measure the quanta of, of flux or the quanta of fluxoid, you know it, um, you know exactly how big the the charge carrier is. And in fact, uh, it turns out from experiment and and from uh, later theory, BCS theory, that the the charge carrier is is E star equals two E meaning that the, the flux quantum phi naught, h over 2e, superconducting flux quanta, super flux quanta quantum, um, is you know, some number 2.067 dot dot dot, times 10 to the minus 19 waivers, which can be measured in an experiment. Now, it's a, it's a fairly small number, so it's tricky to measure. But um, soon after the development of, of BCS theory of superconductivity, it became obvious that this was a, uh, a good experiment to try to do, try to measure how big the superconducting flux quantum was. And two experimental teams, one in Stanford, Deaver and Fairbank, and one in Germany, Nelbauer and Dahl, uh, managed to do this in, in 1961. Uh, the theory support for this uh, rather important experiment was done by Byers and Yang. If you took my topological course last fall, you heard me talk about the Byers and Yang theory, um, theorem, uh, which was developed in the context of, develop, of measuring the, the flux quantum for a superconductor. Um, Yang is this uh, C.N. Yang, the Nobel laureate. Uh, he had a Nobel Prize by that time already. Byers is Nina Byers, a, someone who is a tutorial fellow at Somerville College uh, in, um, in the 1960s, but eventually ended up in, in California, uh, someone who's a, a very good theory theorist who passed away a few years ago. Um, okay, uh, anyway, as with um, the case of uh, superfluid helium, we can take the size of this hole down to, down to essentially zero to make it very, 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 very small. And, um, you know, you only need a very, very small region where the super, superfluid density drops to zero in order to have the phase uh, wrapped by 2 pi as you go down, um, as you go around this vortex. So super vortex, superconducting vortex, vortex. Um, so here, maybe I'll draw a picture of one. Here's a three-dimensional superconductor, and then there's a one-dimensional line down the middle where um, if you go around that line, the phase of the wave function wraps by 2 pi, and in the center of that vortex, the, um, the magnitude of the order parameter drops to 0, or ns goes to 0 in the center. ns goes to 0 in the center. Um, 
Notice I spelled spell center E-R, not R-E, because I haven't become that British yet. Okay. Um, anyway, um, uh, so the... Okay, so what we have, we have to remember that the what's quantized again is the is this combination, this fluxoid combination, um, is the thing that is quantized if we go around a um, if we measure it around a, a superconducting vortex, it, around a single vortex, it will it will measure uh, exactly one unit h over e star. Um, if we try to measure this um, uh, by drawing a, a circle which is very big around the vortex, we will discover that the, um, there's very little superconducting current flowing. Uh, this term will be very small because we're really in the bulk of the superconductor, but the flux enclosed will be almost exactly h over, over e star. On the other hand, if we take this smaller path very close to the center of the, of the, of the vortex, um, then, um, the flux enclosed will be very small. It's not all, and the, the flux associated with the superconducting vortex is not really confined right in the core. It's spread out. Um, it's actually spread out over one London penetration depth. So if you make your, um, uh, if you make your little loop here um, smaller than London penetration depth, then the flux enclosed will not be uh, h over e star, but the difference is made up by the fact that currents are running around. So, so the currents are trying are screening the magnetic field close in to the uh, the center of the of of the vortex. Okay. Um, so actually, maybe I can maybe I can even draw a picture of this. Do I have a picture of this somewhere in the in the no, really no. Okay, let me draw, draw a picture of it. So if you have um, a radius um, radius away from the center of the vortex. Um, the uh, we can draw the current. The current, um, uh, you know, starts out big and then drops down, and then the flux enclosed starts out, you know, small and goes up and then saturates. So that the total, you know, when you add them both up, the total, the sum, is always the sum of the of the um, uh, the sum of the of the two pieces always gives you. Ah, uh, my gosh. The sum of the two pieces always gives you um, uh, gives you one fluxoid, um, but it's divided up differently depending on if you're measuring uh, close in or far out. And this this length scale is is one London penetration depth. I hope that was clear. So this is magnetic field, uh, and this is uh, current. Um, and I've left out the the various constants in this equation: the m star and the e star over n s. Okay. So, um, the I, I think I mentioned this in the last lecture. The prediction of of of, of super superconducting vortices was 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 done first actually by uh, Alexei Abrikosov in um, 1953, I think. Um, but Landau, Abrikosov was in the um, Landau school. Um, Landau wouldn't let him publish it. He didn't believe the result. And then two years later, Feynman published uh, work describing super, superfluid vortices in, in helium-4, and that eventually convinced Landau that this was uh, for real. He let Alexei Abrikosov publish it in 1957, the same year as BCS theory of superconductivity was, um, was developed, and, um, and eventually he won a Nobel Prize for the work in, in 2000, 2003. Okay. So let's um, move on to the next topic, which is very closely related to the last topic. So it turns out there are two types um, related to vortex physics, two types of superconductors, uh, uh, ductors, and or two broad types of superconductors, which are, you know, the, the physics community is not that creative in their nomenclature, so it's called type 1 and type 2. Type two, um, and they if they differ in their phase diagrams. So let me um, draw um, a temperature on this axis, magnetic field on this axis, and this is, I'm going to draw the type one case first. So this is type one, type one case, um, and the phase diagram looks something like this. 
pretty good. Um, so this is, uh, okay, this point here is the critical field, uh, the critical temperature here. This axis is T, this is H, this is known as the critical magnetic field. And then this curve here is the critical magnetic field as a function uh, of T. Out in this region, out here, it's the non-superconducting phase, and this region in here is the superconducting phase. So this is normal out here, and this is super in here. And this superconducting phase is a superconducting phase where the magnetic field is completely expelled from the superconductor. So this is the Meissner effect, or known as the Meissner phase, where no magnetic field penetrates into the superconductor. Now let's, uh, in comparison, let's um, consider uh, type two superconductors. Okay, this is uh, type two now. I can do this without running out of space on the page. Type two, um, we have, um, uh, okay, so this is H on this axis, this is T on this axis, and I draw it a little smaller uh, just so it fits. So this is TC here, and then it divides up into two pieces like this, like that. So this is the Meissner phase here. Uh, Meissner phase. And that down in this region, um, the magnetic field is completely expelled from the superconductor. And this is HC1, um, and this is known as HC2. And in between HC1 and HC2, um, this is the vortex phase. So in this intermediate region here, um, magnetic field penetrates superconductors, but in, in vortices. So the vortex phase um, is also known as the Abrokosov phase, Abrokosov phase. Um, it looks kind of like this. So here's your, your superconductor, and you apply a magnetic field, and the magnetic field penetrates in vortices uh, through the superconductor instead of being completely completely expelled through the, um, from the superconductor. So you can have either complete expulsion of the uh, magnetic field, either, either for type 1 superconductors or type 2 superconductors below HC1, or between HC1 and HC2, you can have a magnetic field uh, penetrating in individual vortices. Now, one thing that's fairly important to realize that if, oops, dum, 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 if the vortices move, uh, move, um, then um, flux moves. And we have curl of electric field is minus dB dt um, for the Faraday effect, which means you create voltage. And creating voltage, that creates resistance. So this is non-superconducting or, or non-creates um, voltage, therefore uh, resistance. You would measure resistance when you try to measure uh, the flow uh, due to the, the electric field being created by the motion of the vortices. So the, the key here is in vortex phase, resistance is zero only if vortices do not move. We talk about vortex pinning, vortices do not move. It's a rather important effect. So it's this is similar. Um, well, okay. So how why how is it you get the vortices not to move? The way you get vortices not to move is um, by having some amount of disorder in the superconductor. Vortices have a tendency to stick to the disorder. Um, uh, why? Because the uh, the superconductivity is killed in the center of the vortex, in the core, where the, where, the or, where the order parameter goes to zero, where the superconducting density, superfluid density goes to zero, the superconductivity uh, is already killed. That costs you some energy. Now, if there's some piece of disorder 
in the in the sample that already has killed the superconductivity, then the vortex wants to sit there because it's not paying any extra energy to kill the superconductivity somewhere else. So this is this will pin vortices on disorder. Um, I'll even write this down. Disorder does this, and will maintain uh, zero resistance. Uh, as long as the, the vortices stay pinned. This is very, very similar to our experience in um, when we studied magnetism, or at least if you studied magnetism, when we found that uh, a, a ferromagnet only stays uh, a real hard ferromagnet in the sense that it maintains its magnetization even when the uh, applied magnetic field is, is, is zero. Um, this only can happen if the domain walls are pinned on disorder, if the domain walls are allowed to um, uh, move around, then um, then uh, the the magnetization will always go away when you remove the uh, applied magnetic field. And, and so very analogously here, you have to pin the vortices on disorder in order to maintain uh, zero resistance, okay? So the, the last thing we're going to do today is try to calculate how big, so back up here, how big is, is HC and how big is HC1 and HC2 and what makes the difference between type 1 and type 2 superconductors. So this is basically uh, exercise in thermodynamics. So a little bit of thermodynamics, which is always a little bit difficult, but let's see if we can do it. Um, so in, in practice, how big is, is, is HC? HC, well, this can vary from milliteslas to tens of teslas, 10 teslas, something like that, tens of tesla. Um, and the millitesla tends to be for a low critical, field, critical temperature and tens of teslas for a high critical temperature. So both, if we back up to this, this picture, um, when the critical temperature is high, the critical magnetic field is high as well. And the reason for this is because both temperature and magnetic field so destabilize superconductivity. Um, but if you have a very, very strong superconductor, something that can withstand a very large temperature, it can probably also withstand um, a very large magnetic field. So uh, large TC tends to mean uh, large um, uh, critical magnetic field as well. Um, so let's see if we can calculate it in more detail and find out what the relationship between these two things are. Um, we'll use our thermodynamics. We'll know that the change in the Gibbs free energy is minus mu naught, uh, I guess, m dot dh, um, I guess, times volume, if we're thinking m, m is per unit volume, I guess, magnetization per unit volume. Um, so this allows us to write the Gibbs free energy, Gibbs, um, is going to be at, at, at some h and t, is going to be, uh, this will generally be Gibbs free energy at h equals zero and t. Um, it was just going to be the integral of, of this expression. So that will then be minus mu naught volume integral of magnetization h prime dot dh prime from zero up to up to h, where the magnetization uh, we can all assume that that it's in the linear regime, so this is a chi times h, the susceptibility times h. Now for type one superconductors, type one superconductors, the magnetization is the you know the perfect diamagnet that chi equals minus one. Um, so the magnetization is, is exactly minus um, the, applied, the applied field. So we can then just plug um, this expression into here and do the, do the integral to get G for a superconductor, type 1 superconductor, H and T. Or it doesn't have to be type 1, but it has to be in the Meissner phase. It has to have a complete expulsion of the magnetic field in order that the... Um, uh, Maybe I should say for Meissner phase, Meissner, um, the magnetization is exactly minus minus h, um, minus g super 
um, of h equals zero, t will be just the the integral of um, minus h dh, which is uh, we have the prefactors um, u naught v, and then it's h squared over two. Okay. Now um, at um, the critical field h c, uh, there's a transition. We get a transition from super to normal, from super to normal, which means what? Well, it means um, g super at h critical and t equals g normal of h critical and, and t. Further, um, for normal state, for normal, um, the uh, susceptibility is very, very small, much less than one on absolute scale. So uh, this means the, if we do the same integral here, um, well, the susceptibility is really small, so the right-hand side is going to be basically zero. So this tells us that um, g normal of h uh, t uh, minus g normal um, h equals zero t is is approximately equal to to zero. Okay, so we can take this equality and plug um, this equality into uh, this equation, and then this equation. Um, uh, you okay? So this gives us, and and then using using this as well, we then get. Um, let's see how we get this g normal uh, h equals 0 t is um, minus g super h equals 0 comma t is mu naught v h c squared over 2. Let me write that, h c squared over 2. Let's see how, how that happened. Well, okay, it, it came from this equation up here, and then we plugged in the g super at h um, at h and t uh, at h critical and t uh, we're pulling the h critical up here and h critical over here but g super at h critical t is the same as g normal at h critical t and g normal at h critical t is the same as g uh, g normal at h equals zero and t okay and that's how how we derived uh, this expression here okay now this uh, thing on the right hand side, this thing here on the right hand side, is known as the condensation energy. Energy. Um, and it is, well, you we can see from the equation what it is. It is the uh, amount of energy that you save by being in the superconducting phase rather than the normal phase. So it's basically how much lower is a superconducting phase than, than the, the normal phase. Okay? Um, and notice that it is quadratic in the, um, in the uh, critical um, uh, field. Um, okay, now in comparison, we can think about the vortex phase, thermodynamics of the vortex phase. And the vortex phase, the Gibbs free energy is going to be the Gibbs free energy at h equals zero. Why? Well, most of the most of the, the system is in zero magnetic field. Um, you only have uh, magnetic field penetrating near the ind individual within a London penetration length of the individual vortices. Um, but near each vortex, say there's n vortices, um, each uh, vortex will have so the n will be the number of vortices. Epsilon will be the energy per length, per length, energy per length, per length, and L will be the length of the vortex. So that actually, maybe 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 it's worth drawing that. So so we have a number of vortices here. Um, most of the system is in. Uh, zero magnetic field, except for the area right around each vortex. Um, there's some number of vortices. There's a length L, 
L like this. Um, and then epsilon is the energy uh, per length. The number of vortices, um, the number of vortices, well, each vortex carries one flux quantum. So it's the area times the applied field, the flux applied, uh, well, the top is the total flux applied, the area times the magnetic field and made, put in the right units by the, by the mu naught, divided by the flux per vortex. So this is the total flux applied, total flux applied, divided by the flux quantum. Here, okay? So just plugging this expression for the number of vortices into this expression here, we get, uh, sorry that I had to scroll that off the top, that the Gibbs free energy is the Gibbs free energy at H equals, equals zero, plus the volume of the system. So that volume comes from area uh, here times length here, volume of the system, energy per unit length, H applied mu naught over the flux quantum, okay? Okay, now we compare that to the Meissner phase. Call it in the Meissner phase, we have the Gibbs free energy is G at H equals zero plus the volume mu naught over two H squared. So we can, we can plot these two things. Um, let's see if we can plot it nicely. So, okay, so here on this axis, we have the Gibbs free energy. And on this axis, we have the uh, applied field. The energy in the vortex phase is linear. Um, okay. So the energy in the vortex phase um, uh, energy, and so this is vortex phase. The energy is linear in the Gibbs free energy is linear in the magnetic field, whereas in the Meissner phase, it's quadratic. And the two of these cross over at um, HC1. And, and in terms of these parameters that we've already defined, HC1 is going, just, just setting uh, this expression equal to this expression, solving for H. HC1, I, I guess, is, is going to be uh, 2 times the energy per unit length divided by phi naught. Um, okay, so this tells me that, you know, if we start at, at low magnetic field, low applied magnetic field, and we turn on the magnetic field, it's always lower energy. So we turn on the magnetic field to small magnetic field. It's always lower energy, at a low enough magnetic field, it's always lower energy to be in the Meissner phase where you expel all of the magnetic field. But then when you get to HC1, it's then lower energy to be in the vortex phase where the magnetic field penetrates in individual uh, vortices. So let's write it this way. Um, so at low enough, low, enough uh, fields, um, then um, it always Meissner in high enough fields. Uh, it'll be vortex phase. Now the key here is that if you go to very high fields, you might have killed the superconductivity altogether. So if H C1, um, this crossover field um, here, HC1. If HC1 is less um, than HC, you have a type 2 superconductor, um, meaning, so if, if HC is way up here, then you don't kill the superconductivity until you're in the vortex, until after you're in the vortex phase, until you're above the vortex phase. But if, if HC1 is greater than HC, it's type one. In that case, say say HC one is actually I can make this smaller. Huh? Look at that. Um, if HC one is is down here somewhere, then you increase the magnetic field. You're in the Meissner phase, and then you destroy the superconductivity um, uh, 
completely before you ever make it to HC1. And that will give you a type 1 superconductor where, where there's no chance for, um, for a magnetic field to penetrate in individual vortices because by the time you get to this transition point, HC1, you've already destroyed uh, superconductivity altogether. Okay, that's the end uh, of this lecture, and next lecture we will start uh, microscopic theories with uh, second quantization. So, um, uh, thanks for coming.